And welcome back, everybody, to the Law and Crime Trial Network. We have a packed afternoon in store for you here. But first, I want to turn to an interview we have of the prosecutor in the Denise Williams case. John Fuchs uh, joins me from Florida via Skype. John, it's so great to have you. We followed this case very closely, covering it gavel to gavel. First, I want to get your reaction uh, to what happened late Friday evening. The reaction is um, that we were finally able to give justice for Mike Williams and his mom, Cheryl, who fought a very long battle, uh, 17 years, um, 18 years ultimately, to, uh, to get to this point. So have you, were you the prosecutor involved in this case from the beginning, or how did you personally get involved? Uh, I was a supervisor. It came into, it, it, when cases come in, they're assigned to certain divisions. I'm the supervisor of that division. Uh, I assigned it to Andy Rogers, who was the initial prosecutor for the kidnapping aspect. Andy worked closely with me and, and kept me apprised along the way because I obviously knew the, the larger implications there regarding Brian Winchester. Um, and as we progressed, he got into plea negotiations. Um, I was, the, I guess, guiding him, if you will, and mm -hmm. he was the actual prosecutor. Um, and ultimately, whenever it came down to seeking to proffer, um, and Brian Winchester's sentencing, um, he actually asked me to step back in, and I took over as supervisor. So let me ask you this. I know it's always tough in cases like this, but here you're dealing with a case where, you know, Williams and Winchester maybe arguably were both equally to blame for what happened, but you have uh, Winchester as being the one that actually goes with Mike Williams, pushes him off that boat, and then admits to shooting him in the face in this brutal, brutal death. Um, the family ha goes years and years and years without knowing what's going on. Right. You know, some an outside person might say, wait a second, Mr. Winchester got off pretty easy here with 20 years. That's correct. And, 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 and doing the evaluation, that certainly is one thing to be said. Um, it was a very, very difficult decision to do the proper agreement that we ended up doing. Um, it wasn't one that was taken lightly. Um, the problem was that without doing that proper agreement, uh, Mike Williams is still a missing person. He's never recovered, and his family does not have closure nor the ability to properly bury him. So, um, that was that was the factor. So, John, you're saying, and I think it's pretty evident through the case, that really, without Brian Winchester's testimony, you would have had no case against Denise Williams. You would have not been able to close this. It would have still been an open murder disappearance case. Absolutely, because until we did the proper agreement, we didn't know even know where Mike Williams was. Uh, Brian Winchester was gave us the information that led us to the body. At that point, we could determine it's a homicide, which then um, got the ball rolling, if you will, on the investigation, which allowed us to secure the confidential informant, and then ultimately secure the audio recording that was um, that was used in the course in the during the trial. Okay, I got to ask you because I have so many. This this Brian Winchester um, guy is really kind of a mysterious guy in so many ways. Were you actually part of the some of the interviews of Brian? Yes, ma'am. Whenever it, we initially negotiated the proper, we started out, um, and I made the decision that we would use our investigator, Jason Newland, uh, because he really didn't have any preformed ideas of what happened here. One mm -hmm. of the things we into is over 18 years, everybody comes up with a theory about what happened. So we utilized Jason Doolin because he didn't have any of those theories, really. Huh. Um, and Jason went into the office there where we did our library, we did the, the proper agreement, and we actually used Skype uh, to monitor uh, from another room. And I was there along with Andy Rogers and Florida Department of Law Enforcement personnel that had been involved in this case for a very long time. Okay, before we get to some of the cross-examination of him, because I want you to react to that, I, I've got a quick question. When you were hearing him uh, being interviewed for the first time, what was your reaction? Here, all of these years go by. You're not able to solve this case. Did you think this guy was a liar? Did you think he was telling the truth? I mean, how did you know what to believe and what not to believe? In watching Brian Winchester tell the story the first time, mm -hmm. uh, there really was not a whole lot of doubt that he was lying. It huh. was the the way he 
portrayed it, he quite frankly would uh, deserve an Academy Award if he was lying. Um, but the way he portrayed it um, left little doubt. But of course, we did our due diligence and went back and tried to uh, uh, corroborate the things that he had said and were able to do so on many different things, uh, though that could be corroborated. Okay, so let's listen to, because we know we've been playing throughout the last hour a lot of his direct testimony about what happened when they went out on the boat, how he pushed Mike Williams off the boat, how it didn't go as planned, so he ended up, he, he found something to hold on to, so Brian Winchester ended up shooting him in the face. But let's get into some of the cross-examination, because I think this hones in on probably some of the points the jurors were thinking about as they took this case back and deliberated it. Take a listen. You didn't straight away go to law enforcement and volunteer the details of the Mike Williams murder, did you? Absolutely not. In fact, while you were in jail awaiting the resolution of your kidnapping case, you decided you were going to take certain steps to try to frustrate the prosecution of the armed kidnapping case. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. I was desperate to do anything that I possibly could to avoid going to prison. And that included obstructing justice, didn't it? Yes, sir. That included approaching an individual named Wade Wilson and offering to have him pay money to try to influence the outcome of your kidnapping case. I don't know who approached who initially, but he and I had discussions along that, those lines, yes, sir. Is there ever any discussion about paying Wade Wilson to kill Denise Williams? Wade brought up the fact that he had been a hitman in his past. I, I think he was lying, but he did offer to uh, make Denise go away and make other witnesses in the case go away. And I said, don't ever speak to me of that again. So you were drawing the line at having witnesses eliminated? Yes, sir. You were not drawing the line at having witness testimony and other evidence fabricated? Correct. And you talked with other people about helping you fabricate evidence and develop ways to frustrate the prosecution. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. Talked to a woman named Kimberly Adams. Yes, sir. Right. You offered her money to try to help you obstruct justice and witness tamper. No, sir. I didn't offer her money. Did she end up getting money from you or a family member? Um, I think I think she got money uh, from my dad, but that was not a quid pro pro. I can't say that, but it was not pay you to do this. So her her role in helping you obstruct justice and tamper with witnessing, she was going to do that for free. I don't believe she ever did anything. I just asked her to do things. You know, I, I don't. None of the people that I asked to help me out of my situation ended up helping me in any way. So, yeah, you didn't want to go to prison. You didn't want to pay the consequences for what you had done, did you? Just like Denise, right? Okay. Okay, so that is, uh, you know, some of the cross examination of the prosecution's key witness. Uh, Brian Winchester. And I think, you know, the defense did a pretty good job in honing in on some of the problems with this guy. I mean, listen, he's not an upstanding citizen here. I think uh, John would agree with me here. But Absolutely. you said that you uh, really worked hard on backing up his story. So my question in listening to most of this trial, I think I caught almost all of it. What specifically did you have that backed up his story as it relates to Denise Williams? We definitely had some evidence backing up um, the actual murder, but her involvement in the murder. You know, back then you didn't have text messages back and forth between the two of them um, right. talking about it or plotting. That's correct. One of the biggest pieces of evidence we had um, if you said you watched the trial, I brought it out during the second closing. Yes. Uh, was the recording that we had between Kathy Thomas and Denise Williams. Um, that recording was done prior to us going to grand jury. So we knew that whenever we ended up making the charges against Denise Williams. And when you listen to that 23 minutes, uh, Kathy Thomas accuses her on two different occasions um, that she was involved in the plotting and killing of her ex-husband, Mike Williams. Um, her only concern during that accusation is whether or not Marcus Winchester knew anything about it. That's not your reaction when you've been accused of murdering your husband in those particular situations. 
Also, on top of all that, she verifies, um, and Kathy Thomas confronts her with the story or the, the message that was given to her to have Marcus contact Brian and let him know they hadn't said anything. But that corroborated part of his story because one of the things that Brian had told us all along was that they had an ongoing agreement that neither one would tell anybody else, nor would they uh, dime each other out. So that corroborated that aspect because as her reaching out, it says, even though I've had you arrested, I'm not saying anything about the murder. Um, you know, Kathy Thomas goes on and there's conversations between her and Denise about the uh, Charles Bunker situation that happened up in Atlanta. That's exactly what Brian had told us about that situation. Mm -hmm. Brian, Brian told us about an affair, the Kathy Thomas uh, conversation. Also, she confronts Denise and said, did Mike find out about an affair? Um, that y'all had, and she talks about the $3,000 that was missing. That was one of those things that we had heard through all the friends that Brian had, had grown, um, you know, we can't bring it out because of hearsay, but we had learned that Brian had concerns about her having an affair, um, that she was doing things, taking money out of their account. Wait, that um, Kathy had had an affair on Brian? I'm sorry. No, 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 <laughs> that, that Denise was Denise. having an affair on Mike. Excuse Got me. It. Yes. So it, all that, that 23 minutes confirmed almost all of that. Very interesting. Okay. When we come back, I hope John's going to stick around with us just for a few more minutes because I have some more questions for him specifically as it relates to those scandalous photos that were brought up during the trial and shown to the jurors. When we come back, we'll talk about that. Stay with us. Okay, welcome back to the Law and Crime Trial Network. We're taking a deep dive into the Denise Williams case. That's the murder trial we've been following out of Florida. And who better to do this deep dive with than the state prosecutor involved in this case, John Fuchs. He joins me via Skype. We had him last block, and he's back to answer a few more questions because there are so many. This is just such a crazy case. Um, so, so, John, before we get to the threesome photo, um, which we did not see, only the jurors saw, uh, tell me about Denise Williams. Uh, she did speak to the police twice, but was she ever asked specifically about what happened to her husband? I mean, she has got to have been a prime suspect for years. Uh, she spoke with agents uh, back in 2005 and 2007, I believe it was. Uh, both times they asked her questions about what she knew. Of course, she denied anything or not have any knowledge of it. Uh, she did so with an attorney present. Um, at the time that the kidnapping occurred in August of 2006, she was talking to law enforcement about that kidnapping. At the tail end of that interview, of course, at that point, she's a victim of the kidnapping. But Florida Department of Law Enforcement agent Mike Devaney came in and spoke with her and asked her questions about the disappearance of Mike Williams specifically targeting whether or not she knew what, whether Brian Winchester was involved or not, hmm. uh, at which time she categorically denied that he was involved in any way, shape, or form. She said, if I thought he was involved in, in any way at all, I would have never married, never married him. Um, I think that she's probably the only person in Tallahassee that didn't think he was involved at that time. <laughs> Wait, so why, I don't think you played any of that interview uh, during the trial. You just didn't think it was relevant? I, I elicited the test. The interview was very long, and most of it had to do with the kid, kidnapping aspect. So it had very little to do with um, this particular case and the, the murder. Um, I did talk to uh, and did, did question Agent Devaney regarding mm -hmm. what she told him when he attempted to question her about uh, the Brian uh, Brian Winchester's involvement, Mike Williams. I did talk to him and, and elicited that testimony, but we didn't actually play the interview itself, no. Okay, so now turning to this other part of the trial that did occupy, you know, some time that you discussed with jurors was the fact that Brian Winchester was having an affair with Denise, but it also involved Brian's wife, Kathy, uh, and they were having, I don't know, some kind of sexual relationship altogether. So let's listen to Brian's testimony regarding that specifically. Yes, sir. What are those photographs of? Um, they're photographs of Denise with my first wife, Kathy, of a sexual nature. And where were those photographs taken? Panama City. When was that trip to Panama City? This particular trip, um, I 
I'm just looking to see if this was one trip or two trips here. Were there multiple? Okay, well, let's talk about that real quick. Yes, were there multiple sir. trips to Panama City with you, Denise, and your first wife, Kathy? Um, we traveled together to multiple places, Orlando, Colorado, Panama City. Um, those three that I remember offhand. Um, I believe these are all the same trip. And when was that? And I believe this was after Mike's death occurred, these, these pictures. When was that? Um, prior to Kathy and I getting divorced, so it would have been between 2000 and 2001. Okay. Uh, prior to you and Denise coming out as having a relationship? Uh, having, a, having a relationship? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, sir. Okay. Um, you, you mentioned you and Kathy separated in 2001, so would this be prior to the separation? Actually, uh, as I remember, this is one of these pictures shows it's a spring break. It, it was a spring break, so I'm guessing... If I were to tell you that they occurred possibly in April or the springtime of 2000, would that sound right? It was either 2000 or 2001. I can't remember when Kathy and I separated exactly, but it was 2000 or 2001. Regardless, they were prior to you and Denise making your relationship public, correct? Yes, sir. Your Honor, this time we will say goodbye. Yes, sir. Okay, so those uh, pictures were also shown to the jurors. Um, let's bring John back in, the state prosecutor in this case. So, I got to tell you, this was one part of the trial I was a bit confused about. Why were those pictures relevant to the case? Because during cross-examination of Brian, that was actually the rebuttal of his testimony. During the cross-examination of Brian, there were allegations as well as their opening statements that the, uh, there was no evidence that corroborated that there wasn't, in fact, a relationship between Brian Winchester and Denise Williams prior to them making it public in 2003. Those photographs were photographic evidence that they, something was going on back then. And once you brought Kathy in, uh, she verified the dates that that was actually in the spring of 2000, ah. which is prior to Brian to Mike's death. Okay, so interestingly, we also had Ethan Way on this morning, uh, the defense attorney in all of this, and he is still insisting that Brian Winchester and Denise Williams did not have any affair until after uh, Mike disappeared and his death. Um, so okay. you're seeing those pictures back up the story that Brian and Denise were having an affair, but we, so, so without getting too graphic here, since we viewers watching the case were not in the courtroom, unfortunately, and we did not see the pictures, were they of Denise and Kathy or were they of all three of them? Because that makes a difference, right? There was one that was Denise and Kathy only, and then there was a second one that was Denise and, Denise and Kathy, and in the mirror behind them, you can see the reflection of Brian Winchester. Got it. Okay, so you're saying uh, that quite clearly proves um, that the two of them were having some kind of uh, sexual relationship at the time. Yes, ma'am. We also had other witnesses that corroborated and saw things. Um, you know, there was uh, two other witnesses that had seen them together in 1997, interacting as if they were, in fact, a couple that didn't seem like it was a just a friendly situation. We had um, another witness that one of the same witnesses talked about some of the way that Denise acted towards her when she actually was out with uh, Brian Winchester and ultimately they actually were having uh, sexual relations and Denise walks into Brian Winchester's house um, prior to them actually coming out as a public type of dating. She just apparently walked into the house in the middle of having, having sex. All uh, right, so well, this, this case really had it all. Okay, last question, yes. and it's specifically about the insurance policy. Um, you know, Brian Winchester testified to the fact that, you know, he knew about it, but everything was in Denise Williams' name. Do we know what happened financially? Did he end up getting some of that money from the insurance policy, um, or would, did that all go to Denise? It all went to Denise. Denise was, in fact, the sole beneficiary of it. 
Um, there was actually three policies, one for $1 million, one for $500,000, and one for $250,000. She was a sole beneficiary of those policies. He did get some tangential aspect of it because, of course, once they marry, they can go on trips together and do yeah. things like that together that would have been coming from that money. But as far as it going directly to him, he never received any direct payout. So that's a little weird then. So really there was no, like, agreement, you'll get 25% if you do this, and you'll get 50%. So really he did this? He went out and murdered this man because he was so in love? That, that's that's same, it. That's essentially it, and that wow. they wanted to be together. Um, and he even said on the stand that the, the money was a um, – was something in there, but it wasn't the driving force behind this. The driving force behind it was so that they could be together. Wow. Okay, John Fuchs, state prosecutor in the Denise Williams case. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Law and Crime Network. Really interesting to get some insight behind the scenes of this case that we've been watching here on the network, Gavel to Gavel. We're going to let you go and take a quick break here on Law and Crime. Stay with Thank us. Thank you for having me.